All right, here we go. Well, it's great to be in front of so many people who, as I said yesterday, who are dedicated to helping autistic individuals lead fulfilling and productive lives. And what we've seen is that can be a reality. We can make that the rule rather than the exception, just as we saw in the immediate previous presentation. And we're seeing presentations by others that show that in these autism centers, these villages, we can promote fulfilling and productive lives, again, as the rule rather than the exception. So we're going to go right into experiencing sensory issues. Now we can talk about them, but to experience them will give you a much better sense, all puns intended, as to what it can be like on this side of sensory issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into groups of six. Yeah, there's five roles here. There's a bonus role that I'm going to tell you about. So how is this going to work? Well, you don't need to play the person with autism because you're already autistic, so. <laughs> you already know what it's like. You get to be the autistic person. No, just stay there for now. Okay. And you're going to listen to what person number five is reading to you, and you're going to answer some questions about the material. Here we have person number two. You're going to take your ID, mm -hmm. and you'll scratch it up and down the back of his neck like this. Don't give him a paper burn. Don't do it too hard. Be nice to him, but just kind of keep it going. So that's number two. You're the next scratcher. Okay. Number three, do you have a loud voice? I can. You can. I can. Use it. <laughs> Use your teacher voice, and you're going to take a paragraph of text, any paragraph of text, and you're going to read it to them. And you're going to read loud. You're going to become a space invader like this. How many of you know autistic people who are space invaders? <laughs> well, that's what you'll do. Number four, you're the head tapper. So you're going to go to number one. You're going to shoulder and the head at the same time. Don't give them a concussion. Number five, since you already know what it's like to be autistic, we'll put you on the normal voice reader <laughs> duty. So you're going to take a second paragraph of text, maybe from this lovely book of jokes that you put together. Jokes. Yeah, what is it? It's uh, people, autistic children, teenagers, telling to read what they love about life. No, it's yeah. definitely not a joke book. <laughs> I don't know where I heard somewhere that it was a bunch of jokes. But anyways. Uh, Anyways, you'll take this book and you'll read it, and, and then you're going to ask him some questions. You're going to read it in a normal voice, and you'll stay at a normal distance from him. And then there's role number six, and that's the invisible role. And what number six is going to do, we'll put you on number six. And what you'll do is you'll stand behind person number one, and you're going to shake his chair, rip, rock and roll, give him a good ride. So this all goes on for about 20, about maybe 45 seconds. Then ask them a few questions. Then you're going to rotate. So number one is going to become number two. Number two will be three. Number three will be four. Four will be five. And the person's who number six, you get to be the autistic person. So everybody get into your groups of six. We've got three over here. Uh, you can grab some people from over here, people in the back. You also can all get together. It works best if person number one sits down just like that and everybody else crowds around. We'll do this for about five or ten minutes and then we'll talk about our experience. Ready? Go! Should I shake this chair? Yes. We'll, we'll put you on observer status. I, I gave him a, Yeah, you gave him. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, good. Yeah. You already know what it's like to be autistic, anyways. And I'll stay with you because I don't want you to feel too bad. Oh, Take 
and save him. Somebody, you have yeah. 15 seconds or over. Yeah, just 45 seconds or so. Steal somebody from the audience there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're trying to rustle up people. Yeah, roust somebody up. Yeah, yeah, let's pull them right over. Rotate it around. Oh, you got your growth. Good. Space so invader. I couldn't get money, so I couldn't get money, and then we were just so into my All right, let us get back to our seats. Uh, you, may, you may not have had a chance to be the autistic person, but we're gonna talk about it and see what people experienced. All right, so who wants to report on their experience being person number one? Person number one. You have volunteered to talk about what it's like to be person number one. Uh, it was extremely overwhelming. Uh, it was like all the possible things that you can think about at one time, and it was extremely hard to pay attention. Obviously. All right, so overwhelming, hard to pay attention. You don't know any autistic people who seem to be overwhelmed, do you? <laughs> no, no, I didn't think so. All right, how about a number one from this table who wants to talk? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, with so many things going together, someone rubbing my back, someone scratching, someone talking, someone uh, you know, doing something with my chair, it was so disturbing and I couldn't pay attention to anything, what exactly was going around me. Nor can I hear, nor can I understand, nor uh, I can feel this itching there. So not everything was going at one go, and I couldn't, do, I couldn't actually pay attention to what should I do, should I hear? Should I um, tell the person teaching me not to do it? Or the person, re um, I mean, doing something with my chair to stop that? It was going so many things. So uh, actually, I cannot concentrate in anything. 
All right, so do you know anybody, any autistic people who seem to have a hard time concentrating and knowing what to focus on? No, I didn't think anybody did, but I just thought I'd ask. What about at this table? Who wants to, who was a number one? It was irritating with all the information coming in, but the most annoying thing for me was there was this one person who was talking. I couldn't hear her, so it was annoying because I couldn't hear her because there was so much happening around me. And so that was irritating me more than anything else. I was like, talk louder, do something. All right, so irritated. You don't know any autistic people who seem irritated, do you? No, no I didn't think so. What about over here? Who's, who was a number one? Jalen. I had a headache. Uh -huh. I was patted on the head so much. All right, so you got beat up around the head and you got a headache. And what you've done is you've shown us, you've, you've uh, experienced a little bit as to what it's like to be on this side of sensory issues. However, with these activities, with simulations, uh, there is a difference between the true experience and what you experienced, even though you got a good flavor of it. And what are the, some of those differences? Well, one of those differences has to do with time. You knew this was gonna be over in five or 10 minutes. What about the autistic person who lives with this day in and day out at home, school, the community, wherever they may be? You can't turn it off. So there's one. There's also another interesting difference, and that has to do with language. Sometimes when I do this, somebody jumps out of their chair and they usually flap like this, and they say, enough, stop. So if a member of your group had done that, would you have stopped? Yeah, you would have stopped. So what does that suggest? One, your communication is understood, and number two, the communication is valued. How many times do we just kind of push through or try to push through? No, you've got to finish this. You've got to finish. Can't stop. I thought autistic people were supposed to be like that. We need to finish, but you need to finish. Maybe you just need to stop and take a break. And it's important to be aware of how that autistic person is communicating. And then there's a third. What were the expectations for you to get the answers right? somewhere between zero and none. What are the expectations for the autistic person to get it right in school, at home, in the community? So this little exercise gave you a little bit of an idea of what it can be like on this side of sensory issues. Your brain is a sensory processing machine. This is, how it this is what it devotes most of its energy to. And most of the time it works just fine. And you're pulling information from the five outer senses, from a number of the inner senses, and you're putting it all together reasonably well. And most of the time it works. However, sometimes it doesn't work. And that's when you have sensory processing disorder. And this is something that's not brain damage. It's not due to damage or differences in the sensory organs. They're the same as everybody else, but when that stuff goes through the spinal column, most of it, and goes into the brain, something happens, it bunches up, just like traffic here in Calcutta. So it bunches up and then goes forward and bunches and forwards, and it makes a mess, just like traffic makes a mess out of your schedule. So as we talk about those senses, many occupational therapists think about outer and inner senses. You've got the outer senses, sight, touch, taste, hearing, and smell. We learned those in grade school, that's pretty easy. There's a number of inner senses. The vestibular helps us keep our balance. And then there's proprioception that tells us where our body parts are in space and how much force to use to accomplish a task. Well, proprioception's an interesting one. Let's try something. Everybody touch the back of your chair, including the people in the audience there. Touch the back of your chair. All right, it looks like you all got it. You can let go. You did very well. Great work touching the back of your chair. Uh, most of you, probably all of you, take it for granted. You know where your body ends and where the chair begins. But many of us autistic people don't have that good, have poor body to environmental relations. If you don't know where your body is, you're not going to be able to do very much. And that's why it's important to be so aware of 
potential sensory issues, how the sensory system works, and what we can do to help, sensory, help deal with these sensory issues. And one of the great things that you can do to help with sensory issues is movement. Movement's a great way to figure out where your body is. And that's what Joanne and I did uh, before our session here, is we spent an hour with autism movement therapy type stuff, dancing and moving around, crossing the midline, doing two things at once, putting together or integrating all the parts of the brain, and that's what we need. There's yet another, uh, there's also another uh, sense called interoception, and it's relatively, it's not a new sense, but recently discovered or recognized, and that tells you inner states of your body. So how many of you know when you, you're full and it's time to stop eating? That's interoception. If you don't, then you have problems of eating too much or too little food. So these are the senses. They affect us in different ways. Many of us, for example, perceive fluorescent lights like you perceive a strobe light. Strobe light's fun with parties, but you're not going to make it through a whole day in a room lit with a strobe light. Recess lighting fixtures, that does it for me. Yeah, those guys, here's a great accommodation, as uh, Wen just demonstrated as well. Um, but he uses his hat for a different reason. I use my hat due to these recessed lighting fixtures, spotlights. Looking into a spotlight gives me a big old headache. For Wen, at least what I heard him talk about yesterday, this hat, helps him feel where his head is in the environment. Where is the body in the environment? And many of us wear hats for that reason. Uh, but uh, for different people, it's going to be different reasons. So those are some of the sensory issues. Haircuts are a real common challenge for us on the autism spectrum. Why is that? Strange smells of the potions and whatnot that exist in a barber shop. The light touch hair falling on the skin. For me, it was none of the above. But I, wasn't, I wasn't thrilled about these things, but it wasn't any of the above. When hair gets cut, each strand gets a little tug along the way. And some of us feel that tug a little bit more than others. And that's why I would always tell my parents, cutting hair hurts. And it did. But we didn't have the language, we didn't have the understanding at that time. Uh, to be aware of these things. So the inner and outer senses, those of us who are hyposensitive to things that overwhelm the senses, I refer to them as sensory violations, anything that overwhelm one or more of the senses, those of us who are hyper or too sensitive, too much is coming in. It's like, it's like a slider, it's on way too high, the volume's too high. Others of us are hyposensitive, which means not enough comes in. And it can switch back and forth. Many of us on the spectrum have to rely on undependable information from the environment. And if you can't depend on information from the environment, it's going to make processing that environment difficult. And it's also going to make preparing for change very difficult as well. We talked a little bit about proprioception, deep pressure often calms the proprioceptive sense. Another area that proprioception is really important, as I see Chris not quite doing, but it looks like he's about to. How many of you take for granted you know how hard to hold your pen? And how far to move it around to write? But for many of us, it requires a lot of concentration, and we still don't get it right. One of the worst things I could experience in school, other than bullying, was to walk into a room with a paragraph on the board. So what does that mean to, what does that mean for the uh, autistic child, uh, the child having difficulty with writing? It meant that it would take me all period to get through a few words and everybody else had gone to recess. Now we have a better understanding, we have accommodations, we have strategies, so people who have the difficulty with the physical aspect of this can find other ways to get their words out. At age eight, as I mentioned yesterday, I was fascinated 
with bicycles. Maybe it had to do with all the spinning parts. Whatever it was, nothing was better than turning the bicycle upside down and getting that rear wheel to spin just as fast as it would go. It took me a while to learn how to balance on a two-wheeler. Just wasn't working. It kind of almost worked, but never quite got there. And then one day my parents put me on a grass field and suddenly I could ride. So why did they do that? Well, at that time my parents probably thought their son is afraid of falling, he's so afraid of falling that he can't concentrate and ride properly. And it kind of makes sense, but I think there was another reason. As we think about riding in a field on the dirt, as opposed to smooth pavement, it's bumpy. You have to push a little bit harder. And those of us who are hyposensitive, as I was, am, in the proprioceptive sense, a sensory seeker, I needed more sensory input into my body so that it could feel what it needed to do, and suddenly I could ride the bicycle, which could then be generalized to riding on smooth pavement. Another area of sensory issues that's important to address, self-stimulatory behavior. How many of you engage in this type of stuff? And as I look about the room, I see a lot of it going on. So Rob, you raised your hand. So are you autistic? Uh, you are now. I admit it. I admit I'm not. All right, there he goes. He admits he's not, but he is now, or at least by the time I'm done with him, he will be. <laughs> not yet, that's all right. But how many of you bounce your leg when you're sitting in a chair? How many of you play with your hair? How many of you doodle? How many of you bite the end of your pen? And so why do you do that? Who wants to tell us why you engage in these behaviors? Who wants to tell us? Who said anxiety? You did? Right. So what does it do to the, for anxiety? Soothes it, brings it down. How many of you do the stuff in order to stay awake? Especially if you're sitting in a chair for a long period of time not moving. So you're bringing things up, finding the optimal level of engagement for your brain so that you can learn. So everybody does this. Everybody engages in, is it repetitive, non-functional behavior, or do we reframe it as self-regulatory behavior so that the person can pay, pay attention? So what's the difference between autistic people and everybody else? Most adults have learned socially acceptable stims. Those of us on the spectrum tend to be more sensorially dysregulated, which means the attempts to regulate are going to be even bigger. They're going to be more pronounced. So what's one common one? Let's all flap away. You got it. Let's all do it. I want to feel the air move. <laughs> uh, you're a little bit too good. Oh, you're autistic anyways. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Now over here, you're pretty good too. A little too good. And I'm seeing all kinds of variations. There's the parallel flap, there's the... Going this way, the asymmetrical, there's all kinds of ways to flap. Is there anything wrong with flapping? No, there's nothing wrong with it. But is it possible that it could be disruptive in a given situation? Yeah, it could be. So here's my classroom. And there's Chris, who's flapping away. And it's a little bit disruptive. Maybe he's knocking, maybe he's knocking into someone while he's doing it. And it's getting in the way. So quiet hands, hands down. Is that going to work? No. He sticks his tongue out at me, and it continues. Just like anybody who's bouncing your leg, if I say, stop bouncing your leg, you'll probably be able to keep it down for a little bit, and then it comes back and it's going to come back more. So you, you brought up a very interesting point. If we try to stop this, it's likely that whatever replaces it, because the need is going to be met, is going to be more disruptive and more difficult to deal with, and you will have wished that you just left that thing alone. But sometimes you need to redirect. So what I might do is I go over to Chris as I'm teaching my class and say, here's a squeeze ball, squeeze this. And he's squeezing it. That's a little bit less disruptive, and he's still getting his sensory needs met, 
because they are going to get met whether we like it or not. And speaking of flapping, where do we see flapping? Anybody watch The Price is Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the person gets called down to the get down to the stage to choose a door or something, and they're all too excited, and they're screaming, going, eh, like that. And <laughs> so we all flap, and there's reasons to do it. Uh, maybe this guy has some sensory issues. That's why he looks like that. So if you see anybody with these characteristics, if you have these characteristics, well, then maybe you have some sensory issues. So one way we can look at it is that if you're autistic, you're going to have sensory issues. I've yet to meet an autistic person who doesn't have sensory issues. Although I do have one friend who says he doesn't have sensory issues. He's on the spectrum. But I also wonder why the lights are off and the shades are down in his house. You wonder. So how does this play out? Let's take a look at Greg the ball thrower. Fascination and sensory issues. We're looking at inclusive schooling. Here he is. So here we've got Greg. He's an elementary school, non-speaking child, and he loves balls. If there's a ball in the room, he's going to go right to it. Even if it's in a drawer and the drawer is closed or it's up on a shelf where you can't see it, somehow he'll find it. He gloms onto this ball. He squeezes it, he pushes it hard against his cheek like this. He's a Jay Leno child. How many of you know who Jay Leno is? He has a huge chin. So he's the type of kid who comes up to you and he kind of digs his chin into you, into your head or your shoulder or whatever it is. That's a Jay Leno child. He's also a sensory seeker. He's seeking sensory input. So he's doing that with, his ball, with that ball as well. You attempt to engage him in pushing the ball back and forth or kicking it back and forth. He doesn't have enough control over his body. It just causes him to be frustrated. So it's written in Greg's educational plan that all balls be kept out of sight. But his teachers aren't always successful in doing so. As a result, Greg is considered to be the school's most difficult students. So we call in the consultant. And Rob, the consultant, comes in, and he says, oh, I think we found a very powerful reinforcer. So we're going to have him do this so that he can get that. It hasn't worked. So what are we going to do? How are we going to, one, get Greg to be aware of us, to work with him? Why is he doing this stuff? What sensory issues are going on? Is there a way that we can allow Greg to be in the same room as a ball without engaging in this type of behavior? And what are you going to do? Because we tried setting something up where uh, Wen sits in the chair quietly, looks at me. It doesn't work. And if I give him the ball, I can't take it away anyways. So maybe what I would do is I would come into the room with a whole sack of balls, hundreds of them, different sizes, colors, all kinds of dimensions. And what Wen likes to do with this ball, I'm not going to get too close because it might be feedback. It makes me nervous. What we're going to do with Chris, because when he gets a ball, he throws it. That's the other thing he does. Chris, have a ball. Thank you. And he throws it. Here. Here. Here, 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 here. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up a system. It comes directly from the Miller method, a system, a unit of behavior around a person, object, event, or an idea. We're developing expectations. We're developing a relationship. And then once I get that going, and he's doing it without support, that's when I start expanding the system by presenting the ball in different places. Oh, it's a lovely music. Oh, we have one minute left. We have 60 seconds to go. And in that way, what I've done is I've developed a relationship with Chris here, and I'm working with him. Yesterday, I talked about transitioning from a deficit-based model where we do things to autistic people 
to where we work with the characteristics. This is what he likes. Okay, let's do it. And let's find a way to use what the person likes in order to develop a relationship or teach whatever needs to be done. So in the remaining seconds that we have, uh, I did say that I talk about assessment. So here's one of the go-to gold standard assessments of sensory issues. The Sensory Profile by Winnie Dunn and Katana Brown that assesses for sensory issues across these six domains. You answer a bunch of questions, it's a survey, and you score it up, and then you get a pretty diagram like you see on the right, which then explains various aspects of the sensory profile and what can be done about it. So anyways, I can see that we're at the end of our time. It's been fun talking about sensory issues, experiencing sensory issues. If you've got questions about them, well, I'm here for the rest of the day. Uh, there's also always my website in which you can reach me and pull out that phone and take a picture because that way you'll have it forever. And again, thank you very much for all the work you're doing to support autistic individuals to lead fulfilling and productive lives.